Here's a lesson on composite functions, which are just functions of functions. So if we have two functions, let's say function f and function g, we can combine them using a process called composition, which can be represented using the following notation. We can write f composed of g by writing f and then an open circle and then g of x. Or another way of writing that, which makes it more clear what that means, we can write it like this, f of g of x which essentially means we use the output of g of x as the input for the f of x function. And when reading these notations, we could say f composed of g or f of g of x. And now let's move on to part one where we see how we can create composite functions. To determine an equation for a composite function, we just substitute the second function into the first function. So to determine f of g of x, we substitute g of x in for x into f of x. So let's work with these two functions. f of x is equal to x squared and g of x is equal to x plus three. And let's do part a, where we have to find f composed of g of x. Or another way of writing that would be f of g of x. Now, before we come up with that, maybe a quick reminder of how function notation works. If I wanted to know the value of this function when x was five, I could communicate that five is the input for x by writing f of five equals, and then I would just replace this x with the input of five, making the function become five squared, which is 25. So this just says that the value of function f when x is five is 25. Well, what we're trying to figure out here is function f when the input is g of x. And remember g of x, is x plus three. So I can replace g of x with what it's equal to, g of x is x plus three. And now I can see that x plus three is the input that must go in for x into the f of x function. So I'll just replace the x with x plus three, making the composite function become x plus three squared. And then we could leave that in factored form, or I could expand it x plus three squared means we have two factors of x plus three being multiplied together. When doing all four multiplications and collecting like terms, I would see that this is equal to x squared plus six x plus nine. So hopefully you can see what happened here was the g of x function becomes the input for x in the f of x function. So I just take what g of x is equal to, which is x plus three, and that becomes the input for x into the f of x function. So I change that x to x plus three, and the f of x function becomes x plus three squared. Let's try doing it the other way. Part b, this notation says we have g composed of f of x, or another way of writing that would be g of f of x. So f of x is the input for the g of x function. And what is f of x? f of x is just the x squared function. So this is equal to g of x squared. So this x squared becomes the input for x in the g of x function. So I need to switch that x to x squared, making the function x squared plus three. And now let's try part C. This one's a little bit trickier because it involves an inverse function. We want to evaluate the inverse of g at g of x. Well, let me start by figuring out what is the inverse of g. So here's my g of x function. If I want the inverse of g of x, I'll start by writing the g of x function as y equals x plus three. And then to find the inverse of this function, inverse functions have their x and y coordinates switched. So I have to switch x and y algebraically. And then isolating y by subtracting this three to the other side, I have y equals x minus three as the inverse function. And I can use the inverse notation that looks like this. So this is the inverse of g of x but I want to evaluate that inverse at an input of g of x. And remember g of x was x plus three. So that's going to become the input in the inverse function. So this x plus three is the input for the x in my inverse function. So I'll rewrite the inverse as I'll change the x to x plus three and it becomes x plus three minus three, which would just give me x. And remember inverse functions do the opposite operations as the original function. So it should make sense why those operations canceled out and we're left with just x when we sub a function into its own inverse. 
And this question not only asked us to determine the equation for each composite function, but it also said to then graph the function. So I need to take these three functions that we just determined, I need to graph them all. Let's start by graphing part a, which if I look at this format right here, the x plus three squared, that's actually in vertex form. So that'll make it easy to graph this function. Remember, vertex form for a quadratic looks like this, where the vertex is at the point h, k. So in this equation, the h value is what we're subtracting from x. So we must be subtracting a negative 3 to make it look like x plus 3. And the k value is what's added after the binomial squared. I don't see anything, so the k value must be 0. For this quadratic, our vertex must be at the point negative 3, 0. So I'll go down to my graph, which is on the next page, and I'll plot the point at negative 3, 0. And I know this quadratic actually opens up. If I go back to the equation, the a value from vertex form or from standard form, I see it's positive 1. When the a value is positive, I know the quadratic is going to open up. And from the standard form, I can also see that the constant value is 9, which means the y-intercept will be at 9. So maybe I'll go ahead and plot that y-intercept at 9. And because quadratics are symmetrical, if 3 to the right of the vertex, the parabola is at a height of 9, 3 to the left of the vertex, the parabola will also be at a height of 9. I could get some more points to get the nice rounded shape. For example, if I subbed negative 2 into either the vertex form or standard form of this quadratic, I would see that the y-coordinate is equal to 1. So I could plot a couple more points on my graph here as well. So that was the graph of f of g of x. And now let's go ahead and graph the second one, which was g of f of x. And this one, once again, is a quadratic. It's the quadratic x squared plus 3. If I wanted to think of that being in vertex form, I could rewrite it like this, x minus 0 squared plus 3. So I could see that the h value is 0, the k value is 3. So the vertex is at the point 0, 3. And because the a value is 1, I know it opens up. So I'll go ahead and graph that with the vertex at 0, 3 and opening up. But to get a more accurate shape, maybe let's get a couple more points to the left and right of the vertex. So maybe I'll make a little bit of a table of values for this function. The vertex is at 0, 3. I'll put that in the middle. And then I'll pick a couple points to the right and to the left of the vertex. And I'll calculate the y values by just taking these x values and subbing them in for x into the equation of g of f of x. If I sub in 1 for x, I get 1 squared plus 3, which is 4. So I know to the left of the vertex, it's going to be at the same y value because I know parabolas are symmetrical on either side of the vertex. And if x is 2, if I sub that in for x, 2 squared plus 3 is 7. So using those points, I can get a more accurate picture of what this graph looks like. And that's the graph of g of f of x. And lastly, we had the inverse of g at g of x, which simplified really nicely to just the function y equals x, which is just a linear function that has a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of 0. So I could graph that one quite easily, plotting the y-intercept at 0 and a slope of 1. So just go up 1, right 1, plot another point. And that was the inverse of g at g of x. And now let's go on to actually evaluating a composite function at a specific x value. In part two, it says to evaluate a composite function f of g of x at a specific value, we start by evaluating g of x at that specific value, and then substitute that result into the f of x function. So for example, if we have these two functions, u and w of x, let's figure out what u composed of w at two is equal to. Or another way of writing that would be u at w of two. So we use the output of w of 2 as the input for our u of x function. So let's start by figuring out what is w of 2. If I want to evaluate w of 2, I just substitute 2 in for the x in my w of x function. So this becomes u at 1 over 2 minus 1, which is u at 1 over 1, which is just u at 1. And to evaluate u at 1, I of course just use 1 as the input for the x's in my u of x function. So I'll replace those x's with 1. And then I can evaluate this. 1 squared plus 3 plus 2. That's just 1 plus 3 plus 2, which is 6. And now let's do part b, where it says evaluate w of u of negative 3. So let's figure out what is the output of u of negative 3, and then use that as the input for my w of x function. So if I want u of negative 3, I need to replace x 
in the u of x function with negative 3. And if I evaluate that, I get 9 minus 9, which is 0, plus 2, which is 2. So u at negative 3 is equal to 2, and now I need to evaluate w at 2. So I'll just, into my w of x function, change the x to 2, which gives me 1 over 1, which is 1. So hopefully you have a good idea now of how composite functions work. And then I have one little application question here at the end to finish off the lesson. This example says that the number of rabbits in a wildlife reserve as a function of time and years can be modeled by this function right here, r at t equals 50 times cos of t plus 100. The number of wolves in the same reserve can be modeled by this function, w of t equals 0.2 times r of t minus 2. Let's find the full equation for w of t. So what I can do for this, I see that the w of t function involves the r function as well. It's equal to 0.2 times r of t minus 2. So let's evaluate what is r of t minus 2. So I'll start by rewriting w of t equals, I'll keep the 0.2, but if I want r of t minus 2, that's just equal to this r function with the input being t minus 2. So I would replace this t with t minus 2, giving me 50 times cos of t minus 2 plus 100. This is the r at t minus 2 function. And now I can simplify this equation by distributing the 0.2 to both of those terms. 0.2 times 50 is equal to 10, so 10 cos of t minus 2. And then distribute the 0.2 to the 100, and I get 20. So there's the final answer. Hopefully that lesson was helpful in your understanding of composite functions. If you want to check your understanding, you can go find the worksheet of practice questions at jensenmath.ca. Jensen